so the next one is this is after college. Uh, it is my favorite Miles Davis record, uh, and it is always, no matter when you ask me, it is always up there in the top three favorite albums of any genre of any time. The whole album. Uh, so this is this album is. For me, it's kind of like the antidote. I mean, I, I am not going to speak like a historian or anything like this, but my impression is that, you know, Miles Davis had this 50s stuff that was really revolutionary and kind of invented the modal cool thing to some extent. But then he kind of hooked up with, this, with the Gil Evans thing and, and all the stuff just kind of got, for me, it's the wrong direction. And I, it's hard for me. I mean, I, I respect the, the compositions and the arrangements and everything, they're, they're, they're good and they're very, you know, sketches of Spain and all those. But to me, it's got a bit of that sort of Maynard ferguson like that sort of blary, unsettled vibe. And so then he, he in, my, in my mind, I'm seeing him walk away from Gil and hooked up with Teo Macero and do basically the opposite. It's like he turned out all the lights and he got his cats in this room, and it's a dark room filled with funk. And he made this this record, which is a it's a record that you you put on, you close your eyes, and all of a sudden side one's done. You get up, flip it over, and close your eyes again, and all of a sudden side two's done, and you get up and you flip it over again because you don't want it to end. I mean, it's such an amazing, beautiful, dark, rich construction, and it is a construction. My, in my opinion, side two is is one of those few perfect album sides, and it was re, it was reconstructed. I mean, it was Teo sitting there building these songs out of all of the all of the tape that uh, that they laid down. It's just so good. Uh, you know, again, Herbie's on this. Herbie's playing piano on this. To Korea as well. Holland, who is always one of my absolute favorite bass players and who will appear on some other records that, uh, that I've got picked out. And enormously Joe Zawinul, again, uh, a, a reflection of the Mercy, Mercy, Mercy pick. And then uh, McLaughlin on guitar, just going out and making these just these amazing sounds. Bitches Brew has a little bit more intensity. This one, for me, this one uh, lets go more and it really just lets you it lets you sort of swim in it in your head. A bitch's brew. I don't know that it's more constructed or or what. I mean, it is a little bit more constructed. It was built in the same way, but for me, this one, the vibe on this one is is detuned a little bit, and it just it resonates with me more deeply. This one, bitch's brew is an amazing album, no question about it. So is uh, Jack Johnson. I mean, they're all these are amazing, amazing records. Yeah. But this is the one that that most uh, does it for me. Found it. Cool. This is one of the very first records that I really got into deeply that I think of as sort of minimalist. It's not minimalist, but it has, an, uh, it has that sort of deep ambient minimalist groove that a lot of electronic music from the same time and currently has. And I followed that path quite a bit too and, and a lot, I listen to a lot of that stuff now. Panther Du Prince and I mean there's so many different I like the Kieran Hebden stuff a lot of stuff even stuff that he produces. The next record is uh, also I got from my parents, but in a very different way. I got into this record when I got to college. And when I left for college, I brought all of my records and all of my cassettes. But then I also snagged a handful of records from my mom's collection. This is one of those. Uh, Mingus uh, um You can tell it was my mom's because she signed it twice. So there's a little red Patty there, and then on the back is Pat Masiello. So that 
makes me realize. So Pat Masiello would have been the, the later signing of it. And I'm guessing that that was probably when she was in New York in music school. Uh, and then the front one was probably before college. So she probably got this record new. I know she was a pianist. So I had this with me uh, freshman year in college. And across the hall from me were a pair of dudes from New York City who were complete potheads and knew more than everyone else because they were from New York City. Uh, and one of them, and they were friends of mine as well. And so he came in and he was like looking through my records and he pulled this out. He was like, oh man, I, I gotta borrow this. I gotta borrow this. <laughs> and I grabbed it, not really knowing what it was. I grabbed it because the cover's awesome. And I grabbed it because I knew it was one that I that wasn't played a ton at home. So I knew that my mom wouldn't miss it. You know, the jazz stuff that, that I knew she would miss would be Nina Simone and you know, the stuff that she played more regularly. Uh, and this was one that I don't remember having heard, uh, so that's why I grabbed it. So he grabbed it, and then months and months later, I was like, "Whatever happened to that that Lingus <clears throat> album that I had? I want to hear it. I want. I don't know. I don't even know what's on it." So I went over and I found it, and I I swept the 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 pot leaves off of it and uh, played it, and it blew me away. I loved it. It's such a good record. It's 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 complete. The whole record is is beautiful. Uh, the compositions, obviously, Mingus is known as a great composer, and the, I loved the idea that it was the band leader was a bass player uh, instead of being a pianist or you know a, a lead instrument like a, a horn or something like that. So yeah, very formative, and 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 this is an early an early one for me. I love this record.